Does anybody know what is the meaning of the word Ishvara? What does the word Ishvara mean? The creator. Creator. Okay. Anyone else? The one who rules. Okay. Anyone else? What does the word creator mean? <laughs> Supreme Lord Mataji. Supreme Lord. Okay. So, according to Sanskrit, the word creator means, control. Uh, sorry, the word Ishvara means controller. So we have Jagadishwara to reference Lord Shiva because he is controlling the material cosmos along with Durga Devi. We say Parameshwara to refer to Mahavishnu because he created this cosmos and he maintains this cosmos. So, you and I are also Ishwaras. Why are you and I Ishwaras? With a small I. There are Ishwaras with capital I, and then we are all Ishwaras with a small I. You and I are also controllers. What are, you, what are we trying to control? What are we trying to control? We can call ourselves Ishvara because we are also trying to control. We are trying to control our destiny. We are trying to control Mother Nature because we want to live a comfortable life. We want to control our happiness. We want to control what happens to us in our life. We try to do our best to control everything. So we try to control people. We try to control things. We try to control events. Very rarely do we try to control ourselves. So we are also Ishvara. So when you read the scriptures, the Acharyas will tell you, they make a statement which oftentimes we are unable to understand. They say that the Jivatma is trying to imitate God. Now you and I may think, why on earth would anybody make a statement like that? Are we trying to imitate God? Indirectly, yes, we are trying to imitate God. The Lord creates, we also create. The Lord maintains, we are also trying to maintain. The Lord destroys, we also have a destructive streak in us. We are trying to imitate God by trying to control everything. But the difference between you and me and God is that God creates effortlessly. Effortlessly. No sweat. For 150 rupees, he's created the most complex machinery. This beautiful design, this beautiful cosmos. 
So when the Lord creates, he does it effortlessly. And everything he creates is biodegradable. Everything we create is not biodegradable. His act of creation is beautiful. Our act of creation, we end up polluting the earth in the name of creation. So the reason we are doing all of this is because we have the same qualities that the Lord has. Why do we have the same qualities as the Lord? Because we come from the Lord. We are a part of him. So the Lord has the capacity to create, therefore we have the capacity to create. The Lord maintains and therefore we try to maintain. The Lord destroys and then we also destroy. So you know how old buildings that are there for many years and if they are occupying prime land, what does the owner do? He sells it and reconstruction happens. So similarly, the Lord creates, maintains and destroys in a cyclical manner. So this whole cosmos he maintains for 311 trillion earth years. And then he destroys it and starts again. So Mahavishnu is doing this all the time. He's creating, maintaining, destroying. Creating, maintaining, destroying. In the context of this material cosmos. Because we are part and parcel of God. Because we are all children of God. We also want to do the same thing. So it's not surprising at all. If the Acharya say, a human being is always trying to imitate God. Because we have the same qualities that the Lord has. But we possess it in very minute quantities. If the Lord can create, we can also create. If the Lord is intelligent, we are also intelligent. If the Lord is famous, we also try to become famous in our own circles in some way, shape or form. So, When we create, the difference is that it takes us a lot of effort. And when we try to maintain, it's a very distressful thing. So say for example, you have purchased a house. Trying to maintain that house is a huge effort. It costs you a lot of money. After you create it, you don't want to lose it. The difference is after the Lord creates, he is completely detached from his creation. But when we create, we become very attached. Oh no, that's mine. Nobody should touch it. Nobody should mess with it. Nobody should destroy it. We get angry if somebody destroys our creation or damages our creation. But the Lord, after he creates, he's completely detached. That's the difference between Ishwara with the capital I. And all of us Ishwaras with a lowercase I. So the tendency for us to imitate the Lord is coming because 
the Lord has these qualities. And when we take birth, we acquire some of these qualities in a very minute quantity. The difference is the Lord exhibits these qualities all the time. We do not exhibit these qualities all the time. Sometimes we are intelligent, sometimes we are not. Sometimes we are compassionate, sometimes we are not. So our Shastras say that the Lord is the cause of all causes, which means there's nothing or no one beyond him. He's called Sarva Karana Karanam. He's the cause of all causes. So to ask the question, who created God, doesn't make sense. Because if somebody created God, then that person is God. Is my voice not audible? Yes, Mataji. It's audible? Okay. Yes, Mataji. All right. Now somebody posted in the chat that it was not audible. <clears throat> So the Lord is the cause of everything, Sarva Karana Karanam, Karanam. But we'll watch a video at the end of today's session, a very short video. So we said the word Ishvara means controller. But the Lord is the supreme controller. But he is not the sole controller. Soul means only, S-O-L-E. So he is the supreme controller, but he is not the sole controller. We'll understand this because if you watch that video, a lot of your doubts about free will will be eliminated by watching a very nice video. So I'm going to share my screen now. Oh, yes, uh, please tell me you can see this. Yes, mother. Okay, very good. So, before we begin, let's offer our humble obeisances to His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So, who is God? <laughs> He's a very famous person. Why is he famous? Everybody talks about him. But then there are some of us who have doubts. Does God really exist? Or are we imagining all of this? What is the meaning of the word Bhagavan? Bhagavan means Supreme Personality of Godhead. If we want proof that God exists, what kind of eyes do we need to see Him? How do we get to know more about Him? How do we typically acquire knowledge? And if the Lord is our Father, our Shastras say the scriptures are our mother. So we take shelter of Krishna and we take shelter of the scriptures. This way, we come under the protection of our parents. So I have a question for you. What do we find attractive in other human beings? What attracts us to another human being? What qualities? Hare Krishna. What attracts us to another human being? What do, you, what do we admire? Honesty, kindness. Honesty, kindness. What else? 
knowledge intelligence intelligence behavior behavior what about beauty we are not attracted by beauty that's only the first time but then we start to recognize how the person behaves mm. that matters more so imagine if a human being can be physically beautiful can you imagine how beautiful god must be so we fall in love with looks first right we are attracted to looks and slot krishna looks so beautiful it's easy for us to fall in love with him but then let's say you you are first attracted to somebody physically their features their eyes the way they talk the way they walk the way they speak what happens after that are you satisfied with just looking at them and admiring them what do you want to do after that you want to get to know them better right because you're not just happy looking at them from a distance so when you are attracted to somebody in a relationship between a boy and a girl what happens the boy or the girl tries to impress the other person they want to know more about the other person who are you who is your family where did you grow up you know what kind of life did you have what are your experiences so we initially we become physically attracted to somebody then after that we want more information about them and as we get more information about them and our attraction increases we want to serve them so what does the boy do he will take the girl to the movies he will buy her a bouquet of flowers he may buy her some nice gifts he may take her out to eat so attraction followed by information followed by service after you've done this three you come to the stage when you cannot forget that person you are always thinking about them you are meditating on them you are absorbed in thinking about what a nice person they are and then you want to make that relationship permanent through marriage through commitment and that commitment says that you want to serve them for the rest of your life so we will follow the same process to establish our relationship with the supreme controller called krishna at first we may be very attracted to his physical form when we see the deity in the temple after that we are curious ah oh, bachcha oh, how are you who are you and where why are you actually standing like that and uh, you know who are you and how can i get more information about you why do you why does everybody call you bhagwan why is everybody worshiping worshiping you why is everybody bowing down to you so you want to know who is god so your source of knowledge is the scriptures if you want to know about your father you have to ask your mother first to get to know your father you have to go to your mother first after you get information from him and you are attracted to him even a little bit more 
Then you want to impress him. How do you impress him? Well, you offer him some patram, pushpam, halam, toyam, which is what he is asking for. In Bhagavad Gita, what Krishna says in Shloka 26 of chapter 9, he says, just offer me a leaf, a fruit, a flower, some water. Imagine you have a loved one, you have a wife or a husband or a child and their birthday is tomorrow. Can you buy them a fruit and say, I love you so much, please accept this fruit? You will get slapped. <laughs> you, they, your loved ones will get very upset with you if for their birthday you tell them, here, take a tulsi leaf. Krishna only asked for tulsi leaf. You also be happy with tulsi leaf. Hekinini, is that true or not? Will your family member be happy with one fruit, with a glass of water, with some tulsi in it? Will they be happy with you if you just give them one flower on their birthday because you love them so much? But look at our dear Lord Krishna. He says, you can express your love to me by just giving me a tulsi leaf with chandan on it. Just give me one fruit. One flower, something to drink, and I will accept your love. This is the difference between a compassionate God and our imitation of God. The Lord is so sweet, everything belongs to Him. You and I didn't create anything. So he is saying, whatever I have created, you just take one piece of it and give it to me. I'll be very happy with you. You will receive my blessings. You will be under my shelter. You will get my protection. Tulsi plant, you and I didn't create. But Lord Krishna is saying, just pluck a leaf and offer it to me with love. And I will protect you. Just how sweet is the Lord that that's all he wants from us. That's all he wants from us. He wants our love. He is not looking for us to impress him with our knowledge about him. He is not impressed with the wealth that you've collected because that wealth belongs to him. You didn't do anything. So essentially, what I walked you through was Jnana Yoga, Karma Yoga, Dhyana Yoga and Bhakti Yoga in this process. This is how we fall in love with the Lord. Hare Krishna Mataji. Hare Krishna. Mataji, how do we continue with the chanting? Some days I skip. Yeah. So, Mataji, if it is okay, can we continue with the class and then we can handle the questions at the end? Is that all right? So, today our topic is Ishvara. So, we said Ishvara means a very famous personality. So famous that those who believe in him discuss him. Those who don't believe in him also are also spending time talking about him, complaining about him. So those who love him, talk about him. Those who don't believe him also spend time talking about him. <laughs> but those who believe in God, how are they talking about him? They are glorifying him. They are praising the Lord. How beautiful he is. How compassionate he is. How merciful he is. 
how kind he is. So devotees always glorify the Lord. But what do the non-devotees do? They say, this God is partial. Look at all the nonsense things that are going in society. Look, Ambani is so rich. Why should one person have all this wealth in their hands and try to control society with all that wealth? God is definitely partial. Or God is bad. Why should children be molested? Why should a woman be raped? God must be bad. He doesn't care. Worst thing is, who the heck is God? I don't need God in my life. I can manage and control everything. Just please, just take God out of the picture. My life is peaceful without God in it. And then you have the intellectuals. No, 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 no. I want proof that God exists. I am a scientist, you see. I've spent years educating myself. I want proof that God exists. And then the worst kind, you have personalities that say, God, I am God. There is real, there is no real God. It's just imagination. I myself am God. The very famous philosopher by the name Epicurus from 300 BC before Christ. Now, what is fascinating is that he actually believed in God. But he also felt that God was playing an outsized role in all of our lives. Which distracted us from becoming a better human being. Which distracted us from working on ourselves. So he propagated this philosophy of Epicureanism, which means, although a lot of what he teaches actually aligns with the scriptures, but he also believed that God is in his place, we should do our thing, you know. God shouldn't play an outsized hero role in our life. That was his point, which of course our scriptures completely disagree with. But the rest of what he taught was pretty much aligned to the scriptures. So for example, he taught that we should lead simple lives. We should engage in high thinking by discussing the purpose of life. He also believed that human beings really fundamentally need to work on themselves so that we can become a better human being. And to become a better human being, we need to spend time with those people who are trying to do the same thing. So this is one of the ABCD's association. Association of devotees. So he taught that a group of people should come together who have the same interests, which is leading a simple life of high thinking, eating simple foods, working on ourselves to become better human beings. And he also felt that the prime purpose of our life is to make sure that we do not cause distress to other living entities, to other human beings. Of course, all of this you can get if you become a devotee of the Lord. So he asks some very interesting questions. This goes to show you that if we really use our intelligence, we can easily come to the conclusion that God doesn't exist. Or God is an unjust God. So his questions were as follows. Is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Which means when evil happens, does the Lord have the ability to prevent it? 
if he doesn't have that ability, then we cannot call him omnipotent, all powerful. And then he twists the question. He says, is he able but not willing? So the first thing is, is the Lord willing to prevent evil, but he does not? Or the other side of the question is, is he just not capable of preventing evil? Or rather, he is able to but not willing to. Which means he sees unjust things happen in society, but he does not step in to intervene. Oh, if that is the case, then he must be malevolent. Malevolent means he must be a cruel person. Then the other more perplexing question is, is he able to prevent evil and also has the will to prevent evil? If he is able to do both, then how come evil took birth at all? Where did evil come from? If the Lord could prevent it, and he didn't do anything to prevent it. Then the flip side of that question, if he's not able to do both, if he's not able to prevent evil, and he's not willing to prevent evil, then why should we call him God? Why should we worship him at all? You see how these questions can lead you to the conclusion that God doesn't exist. Now keep in mind, he did believe in God. As per his philosophy, God exists. But we shouldn't spend too much time about God. We should spend more time on self-improvement. That was his philosophy. So essentially, the conclusion for him is, God exists. I don't need him in my life. I need to sort things out and figure things out on my own. So does God exist? We can see that God exists because our creativity, our intelligence, our talent, our potency and power is derived from the Lord. It's a gift to us from the Lord. There is this very famous painting of Mona Lisa in Italy. The artist is Leonardo da Vinci. Such an expensive painting. It is worth millions of dollars. It has 24-7 security. Imagine. We are willing to spend millions of dollars protecting a painting that is hanging on a wall in some museum. Because we are afraid somebody will steal it. Shah Jahan constructs this beautiful monument for his wife, Taj Mahal, in memory of her. Edison invents the electric bulb. After many, many failures, he finally succeeds. So where is this creative power, this potency, this intelligence? Where is it coming from? It's coming from God. Can someone read the poster? God is love. God is love. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. Yes, so this is simply saying that God means love. That when we love God, we also experience God's love for us, God's compassion for us, God's mercy for us. 
So it's a two-way relationship. It's not a one-way relationship. It's, the, it's not that God loves us and we have forgotten him. Of course, some of us choose to live our life like that. And it's not that we love God and he has forgotten us. That never happens. So this is a two-way relationship. We love God and the Lord reciprocates with, with us. The more that we express our gratitude and love for the Lord, the more you will experience the presence of God in your life. But if we choose to reject God, you will never experience his grace and mercy in your life. So really the choice is ours, whether we want to love God or not. You know, great civilizations have come and gone. Where did they all go? How did they become great civilizations to begin with? To build these great civilizations, they had to use the materials supplied by the Lord. Because we can't even create even a grain of rice. So everything is supplied to us by the Lord and we are simply using it for our own benefit. So civilizations will come and go, human beings will come and go, the cycle will continue. Can someone read the poster? Can somebody read the poster on the right? Is it visible? We don't worship God to gain his approval, but to bask in his love and acceptance. Yes. So we shouldn't be worshipping the Lord thinking he will specially protect us. And we want something from him in return. We love the Lord so that we can experience his love for us. That's all. True love means we love without expectations. But on the material platform, divorce happens in relationships because of expectations. If you didn't do what I wanted to do, I'm unhappy with you and I'm ready to walk away from you. That is selfish love. Selfless love means you will love the other person in spite of their faults of their shortcomings. But the Lord has no faults and no shortcomings. He is perfect. So therefore, for us, logically, it is easier to love the Lord because we accept him as perfect. It is not easy for us to love a human being because we only see their imperfections. So the reason we love the Lord is so that we can experience his love for us in our life. And that love is experienced in our life through his mercy, through his grace, through his shelter. And so there is a very famous story about Newton and his friend. So Newton believed in God. There are a lot of scientists who believe in God and there are a lot of scientists who reject God. Newton says, I believe the more I study science, the more I believe in God. It's obvious right? the more you look at creation, you have to accept that there has to be a creator behind everything. There is some magical function that is at play. So one day, 
Newton, Newton's friend comes to his house. His friend is a scientist. His friend also happens to be an atheist who didn't believe in God. And Newton had uh, an artist create a replica of our planetary system. The sun, moon, and the nine planets. The fascinating thing about this creation, this design, was that it had a handle that if you crank it, it had a mechanical crank, it was, this was created with such perfection that you could, you could actually see the planets in their various orbits. So it was constructed in such a way it included the orbits. The distance, the size was all as per scale. So the scientist friend sees this particular creation of our planetary system on top of Newton's dining table. And he asks him, he gets mesmerized by this beautiful machine that has been created to replicate the planetary system. So his friend asks Newton, Tell me, Newton, who created this? And Newton says, nobody. So the friend says, come on, don't play with me. Somebody created this. Tell me who created it. And Newton says, nobody. And the friend gets annoyed with Newton and says, come on now. Don't take me to be a fool. I know somebody created it. Who created this? Remember his friend did not believe in God. He's an atheist. He's a scientist. So Newton responds to his friend by saying, this thing is but a puny imitation of a much grander system whose laws you know and I am not able to convince you that this mere toy is without a designer and maker. Yet you profess to believe that the great original from which this design is taken has come into being without either designer or maker. Now tell me, what sort of reasoning do you reach such an incongruous conclusion? So Newton was very politely telling his friend, you're foolish. You believe that this entire creation has no designer, has no maker, but you're convinced seeing this replica of this on the table that somebody must have created it. So how can you believe that to produce an object replicating the planetary system somebody was involved in constructing and creating it. But when, for the real thing that actually exists, you actually believe that nobody is behind it. There is no designer, there is no creator. So he's questioning his friend's logic of believing that what existed on his table, somebody must have created. But the real thing is an accident. There is no designer, there is no creator, there is no maker. It's just a big bang theory. Something exploded and something came into being. It's an accident. So even great minds can come to the wrong conclusion that a creator doesn't exist. Even though we see the beauty and the design and the flawless way in which creation is actually functioning and working. So what is the meaning of the word Bhagavan? Parashara Muni, who is the father of Vedic astrology, 
and he was also the father of Srila Vyasadeva who writes all of the scriptures. He defines the word Bhagavan. Remember we said, what attracts us to others? Somebody could be very powerful physically. Somebody who's very knowledgeable, we're attracted to knowledge. We discussed we're attracted to beauty. If Ambani walks into the room, you will put your hands like this and greet him. Because he's not only famous, he's wealthy. He's accomplished some great things. Similarly, if a sannyasi, a great saint walks into the room, you will bow down. Because you will recognize their renunciation. So these are the things that attract us to other human beings, power, knowledge, beauty, fame, wealth, renunciation. Parashara Muni says, Bhagwan Shri Krishna possesses these six qualities in full and infinitely. It is ever growing. His fame is growing, his wealth is growing, his renunciation is growing, his knowledge is complete, he's all powerful. This is the definition of the word Bhagavan. Bhagavan means one who possesses these six opulences in full. In human society, there is no one person who can have all these six qualities. They may have one, maybe two, maybe three. But the Lord has all these six qualities in full. The word bhaga means opulence. The word one means one who possesses. So literally bhaga one. One who possesses all of these opulences is called Bhagavan. Therefore we worship him. Therefore we bow down to him. Therefore we try to impress him. Therefore we try to get to know him better. Therefore we try to serve him, to please him. And our ultimate goal is to love him. So it's easy to love God. The word Krishna means all attractive. One of the meanings of the word Krishna means all attractive. Another meaning of the word Krishna means one who can break the cycle of birth and death for you. So the Lord is the most attractive personality. But in spite of all of his creation, he is completely detached from his creation. We said, right, if we create something and if somebody messes around with it, we get upset. How much mess is human society creating of this material earth? The Lord is patiently watching. He is watching this corruption. He is watching the climate change. He is watching the destruction of forests. But he is detached. It is his creation. But he is watching. Hence, he is considered to be fully renounced. He is not attached to what he has created. But why do we create? We create because the Lord creates. The Lord likes variety. Hence, there are 8.4 different types of bodies. He could have made all of us human beings. Why? Birds, butterflies, cockroaches, plants, viruses. The Lord likes variety. So not surprisingly, human beings also like variety. We're always trying to change things. 
because we are not satisfied with one thing. The Lord is fully self-satisfied. He is called Atma Ram. But he is a very creative God. He likes variety. Because the Lord enjoys variety, we enjoy variety. But how do you see God? Shastra say we need Jnana Chakshu. You can't use your physical eyes to see God. You have to use the knowledge, the eyes of knowledge to understand who God is. The eyes of knowledge can only come if you pursue the path of self-realization. Self-realization can happen, the, can happen very easily when you pursue the path of God-realization first. Remember, Epicurean was saying, Epicurus was saying, self-realization first, forget God. But Vaishnava culture or Bhakti movement means God-realization first. You cannot realize yourself without first understanding who God is. So the formula is just flipped. It's reversed. God realization first will lead to self-realization. But we need to develop these eyes to see and understand who the Lord is. To do that, we need to study the scriptures. There is a little story in our scriptures that says, you know, five blind men trying to describe what is an elephant. And they are only touching one particular part of the body of the elephant and coming to the conclusion that the elephant is like this, that the elephant is like that, that the elephant is like that. So one person touches the trunk and he says, this elephant is like, just like a snake. Somebody else touches the tusk and says, oh, the elephant is an arrow. It cannot be anything else. Somebody else is touching the ears and saying, no, this is an axe. The elephant looks like an axe and feels like an axe. Somebody else who is only touching the elephant's foot is saying, no, 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 I disagree with you. The elephant is a tree. So like this, Somebody is holding on to the elephant's tail and saying, no, the elephant is just a rope, a small rope. So similarly, as human beings, when we try to understand God, it's very difficult to understand God when you only use a narrow path to understand him. So what happens, you will come to the wrong conclusion. You will say God is like that, God is like that, God is like that. So therefore, we depend on our charyas to understand who is God. We depend on self-realized souls to understand who is God. And of course, we depend on God himself because in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna tells us in the Bhakti Yoga section of the Bhagavad Gita, who he is. So the Lord himself tells us who he is. So why is it that logic will not help us understand God? Because we human beings have four defects. All of us have it. We just may have it in different quantities. But all of us have it. One of our defects is that our senses itself is imperfect. We can't necessarily believe everything that we see. So if you look at that diagram, is it an hourglass or is it the facial outline of two people? It depends on how you see it. The other thing is human beings commit mistakes. None of us are faultless. All of us commit mistakes and repeatedly we commit some of the same mistakes again and again. So there is a poster here that says mistakes are painful when they happen. But years later, a collection of mistakes is what we call as experience. Then we are subject to illusion. Anybody and everybody can 
cheat us very easily if we're not smart, if we're not intelligent. And we have a propensity to cheat ourselves and to cheat others. So these are the four defects of a human being. Our senses are imperfect. Therefore, when we look at the sun, we see it as a small disk. In reality, it says there are 26 million Earths that can fill the sun globe. Our Shastras say that the sun is 93 million miles away from the earth. Our Shastras tell us what is the diameter of the earth. Our Shastras say what is the size of this material cosmos. How do they know all of this? Because in our Shastras, there's no mention of technology, microscopes, uh, you know, telescopes. They're not mentioned at all in our Shastras. But how did they know? By the way, modern science has proved that indeed the sun is 93 million miles away from the earth. This was written in our Shastras 5,000 years ago. And it was written 5,000 years ago. It was known forever. How did these great beings know all of this? Through knowledge that comes in the Guru Parampara system. So there are three ways in which we acquire knowledge. Which do you think is the perfect way of acquiring knowledge? There is Pratyaksha Praman, there is Anuman Praman, and there is Shabda Praman. Which is the best way to acquire knowledge? Of these three? What do you think? Is seeing believing? Is experience believing? Or hearing is believing? Which is the best way of acquiring knowledge? Hare Bol, Hare Krishna. What's the best way of acquiring knowledge? Mataji, hearing and seeing. Shabda Pramana, Mataji. Why Shabda Pramana is the best way? Hearing and why is that the best way to acquire knowledge? Why seeing is not believing? Why is hearing considered the best way? Your answer is right. But why? But Because if you hear from a bona fide authority, you can accept that. So let us say how we learn in our life. When you're a little baby, your mother will tell you, this is your nose, this is your eyes, this is your father. And then the father will teach you, this is light, this is fire, that's the sun, this is the moon, this is the table. As a child, you learn by hearing, correct? Yes, Mataji. Everything, when you go to school, when you go to college, if you are there eight hours, five to six hours, you are doing nothing but hearing. Is it not? We are constantly learning by hearing. And by hearing from bona fide authorities, so if your mother says, this is your father, why should you disbelieve her? If your father says, this is a table, do you go out and try to prove or disprove him? No, you just accept it. If your teacher says two plus two is four, you just accept it. You don't start challenging everything. At least for the first 20, 22 years of your life, you're just absorbing everything. Then later on, we become a little bit arrogant and we start questioning things. No? 
once we are intelligent <laughs> once we've got a degree then we begin to question i don't believe all of this nonsense so throughout our life we are learning by hearing so which means even for scriptures you have to learn by hearing shabda praman is very powerful but who should you hear from you should only hear from a bona fide guru you can't hear from anybody who has read the scriptures because we don't know who taught them we don't know if they have understood the knowledge properly or not to become a teacher we have to go through a certification process similarly to become a guru you have to be self realized that is the self that is the certification process you have to be well versed in the scriptures in modern day anybody can put out a youtube video on bhagavad gita or bhagavatam we cannot accept it unless it is based on guru parampara system that is our culture that's all cultures your mother is your first guru you learn a lot from your mother so pratyaksha praman is not reliable because seeing is not always believing optical illusion can bewilder us because our senses are not perfect our eyes are not perfect similarly experience is believing is also not reliable because experience and sometimes theoretical knowledge can only lead you to say it could be this it could be that because we cannot experience everything we don't have the capacity to experience everything darwin who propagated the evolution of man from other beasts acknowledges the hand of the divine he says to suppose that the eye with all its of its inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances for admitting different amounts of light and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberrations could have been formed by natural selection seems i freely confess observed in the highest degree so he is acknowledging that the eye has been designed the way it is the eye has not been a process of evolution so even though he propagates the theory of evolution he acknowledges that the theory of evolution does not justify or does not support some aspects in creation so he is acknowledging that the eyes have been designed by the creator it didn't become that way through the process of evolution so similarly when somebody tries to understand who is god if they do it outside the guru parampara system they can only theoretically say god does not have a form god does not exist god is cruel god is unjust like this you'll come up with the wrong conclusions if you try to use your own experiences to understand who god is so shabda praman is the only way in which we should understand who is bhagavan just like if you want to know who is your father you just approach your mother and ask who is my father and if your mother says this is your father you just accept it you don't try to create an experiment out of it you don't try to speculate you don't try to say maybe could be perhaps you accept what your mother says to be the truth so shri prabhupad says we can speculate for many births for many years and not be able to understand the ultimate goal of life therefore the shastras all advise that we search out a guru if you want to bring an end to the cycle of birth death old age and disease 
you need to know who to approach and what to do and how to do that can only be taught by a bona fide spiritual master so shabda praman in our culture is the best way to know about who is god so we said the scriptures are our mother so we need to approach the scriptures to understand who is our father everything comes in a parampara system there are four vaishnava paramparas started by four great personalities brahma being one of them and the iskon movement identifies its genealogy all the way to lord brahma so our movement comes from lord brahma lord brahma taught this ancient science of god consciousness to narada muni narada muni teaches it as a guru to vyasa dev and from vyasa dev on downwards it has come all the way to shila prabhupad but this is not the only guru parampara there is three more one parampara was established by shri lakshmi devi herself of the worship of lord vishnu and that parampara has an acharya the brahma parampara has an acharya the acharya for the brahma sampradaya is madhvacharya the acharya for the shri sampradaya is ramanujacharya so lord shiva also establishes the worship of vishnu this is called the rudra sampradaya and the acharya for the rudra sampradaya is vishnu swami then the fourth sampradaya that established the worship of krishna or lord vishnu is the sanat kumaras brahma had four sons they were eternally they are eternally brahmacharis they are the four sanat kumaras so the sanat kumaras also established the worship of lord vishnu and their acharya is called nimbarka swami so these are the four acharyas madhvacharya ramanujacharya vishnu swami and nimbarka these are the four acharyas representing the four paramparas coming from brahma shri lakshmi lord shiva and the sanat kumaras so krishna himself says in the bhagavad gita that this knowledge has been coming down that he has handed this knowledge down about himself and about bhakti evam parampara praptam imam rajarshayo viduhu so this knowledge has been handed down handed down through the parampara system and the lord says i taught this bhagavad gita many millions of years ago to the sun god vivashwan and vivashwan in turn teaches it to manu and manu teaches it to king ikshvaku and from there on it has come down in the parampara and krishna says when that parampara breaks i come to reestablish this knowledge and therefore arjuna i am going to speak speak this bhagavad gita to you but this knowledge of the divine has always existed it's not that i am speaking it for the first time on the battlefield of kurukshetra i have already spoken it many millions of years ago i am just getting ready to speak it again to you because dharma has declined and degraded so i have to reestablish this knowledge that is lost so what do the scriptures say about him we are coming to the last few slides there is only one god that means we need to know who is he there are 33 crore demi gods who are they they are all his assistants they try to take care of the universe on his behalf how does god look that is explained in the shastras what are his names that is also there the lord has unlimited names it's it is said that ananta shesha is glorifying all of the lord using the lord's names and he is still not done is glorifying his master mahavishnu where does he live that is also given 
He lives in the spiritual world with all of his devotees. What are his powers? We talked about his six opulences. Of course, his opulences are unlimited, but the six of it being the primary ones. How can we approach him? Where does he live? How can we approach him? Through the process of Bhakti Yoga, through the process of Karma Yoga, through the process of Jnana Yoga or Dhyana Yoga. These are the four ways in which we can approach him. How can we understand him? How do we learn to love him and serve him? And most importantly, why should we love him and why should we serve him? Is there any benefit for us? Is there any benefit for us to love and serve somebody who is not even before us? He is somewhere else. We are somewhere else. But we are being told, no, 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 you love him and serve him. Are, why should I love and serve a deity in the in the temple? Because the Lord says, if you love me and serve me, you will experience my grace in your life. So it is not that the Lord needs your love. He is Atma Ram. He is always self-satisfying. But by loving him and serving him, we benefit. Therefore, Acharya say, we should love him and we should serve him because the ultimate beneficiary is us. Everything belongs to the Lord. The Lord is the supreme controller. So you can't do anything that is going to impress him. But yet he is so compassionate that if you just take one step towards him, he takes 100 steps towards you. That is the supreme love. That's how much he loves you. He loves you more than we can love him. So final thoughts. Can one of you read what is on this nice posters actually? Please unmute yourself and read. We are coming to the last slide. Hi, Bol. Yes, please go ahead. Whoever unmuted yourself. God doesn't want you serving him only because you are supposed to. He wants you serving him because you love him. Yes. We can learn to serve the Lord without loving him. We can learn to serve the Lord because somebody has told you, you better do it, otherwise you're in trouble. But really what the Lord wants is, he wants you to love and serve him because you just want to do it. Not because you are forced to do it. Because a loving God means he never enforces his will on you. Next one. Just because you can't see the air doesn't mean you stop breathing. And just because you can't see God doesn't mean you stop believing. Yes. Air exists because if air didn't exist, you and I wouldn't be alive. Just because we can't see it doesn't mean we don't believe it. So similarly, just because we physically cannot see God doesn't mean we stop believing in him. The bottom one. God doesn't want to take your money. He just doesn't want your money to take you. Ah. This is why we offer charity to the Lord and to the Lord's devotees. Because money can corrupt our ego. So our Shastras say that we have to give in charity every paycheck. Not once in a blue moon you go to Tirupati and put some money in the hundi and come back. Feeling very good about yourself. Every paycheck that you get, you have to give in charity, a portion of it. And by doing that, it also purifies your earnings. Otherwise, you have to accept the karma. Because there could have been a lot of uh, unethical things done. Maybe not by you, but maybe by the company that you're working for. That is allowing you to earn the living. Imagine if you're a butcher. 
and you get paid. How much sin are you incurring by killing animals? Last one. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Which means the Lord is not, does not have a purity test for you. He doesn't say, I will only come and take you if you are 100% perfect. Entrance to my world comes only when you are 100% perfect. But then, what he wants is, you take his shelter and then he will give you the qualifications to enter the spiritual world. He will purify you so that you can enter the spiritual world. You don't have to try to purify yourself independently of the Lord and then say, go knock on his door and say, I'm ready. No, the Lord wants you to knock on his door first. Accept him, take his shelter, get his grace in your life and begin your journey of purification so you can enter your original home. You see how compassionate the Lord is. He doesn't say qualify yourself first before you even knock on my door. He says knock on my door and I will help qualify you and let you in. Last slide. Can somebody read this? Anybody? God doesn't expect us to solve all the world's problems. He expects us not to create them. Ah, important, no? Yes. He wants us to live our life in such a way that we don't create problems for ourselves and problems for others. So if we don't create problems, then we are better off. Next slide. Next uh, poster. The irony is that while God doesn't need us but still wants us, we desperately need God but don't really want him most of the time. Is that the truth or not? Yes. <laughs> the Lord wants us more than we want him. Yes. The Lord doesn't need us. We need him. We desperately need God, yes. but we don't want him. But the Lord wants us. That's how much he loves us. So we said in the beginning of the class, God is the supreme controller, but not the sole controller. So we'll watch a very short video. We'll watch two videos, three minutes each. Because the concept of free will needs to be understood. So let us watch the video. So I'm going to stop sharing so I can pull up the videos. Is that okay if we watch two short videos? I hope you all have six minutes. <clears throat> um, yes. Trying to remember where it is. Okay, here it is. Can you see my screen? Yes. So this is His Grace Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, where he explains how one can understand that the Lord is a supreme controller, but he is not the only one controlling. God is the supreme controller, but not the sole controller. Sometimes people say that what everything that happens is God's will. Now, while such a statement may seem to indicate their faith in God, their unquestioned devotion to God, but such a statement denies the complexity of reality in the world. Everything that happens is sanctioned by God, but it is not necessarily desired by God. In the Bhagavad Gita 13, chapter 23rd verse, it is said, Upadrashta Anumantacha 
परता भोक्ता महेश्वर परमात्मे तिचाप्योक्तो देहे स्मिन पुरुष पर so it says that the supreme lord the super soul the parmatma is what upadrashta anumanta is the overseer and the permitter this means that whatever happens in the world some of it may be what god desires if the people are acting according to god's will but if the people want to act in defiance of his will then he allows them if he allows people to do whatever he wants then how is he in control at all that is explained in another verse of the gita 9.6 it is said that yatha akashasthito nityam vayu sarvatra go mahan tatha sarvani bhutani matsthani te upadharaya there it is said that just as the wind which blows mightily in various directions still stays within the sky similarly all living beings exist within krishna's will that means krishna's will governs the area of our movement not the specific movement that we do krishna has given each one of us free will and by our past karma he has given each one of us particular area in which to execute that free will to exercise that free will So some people by their past karma may be very poor in this life, and within the area of their power, if they desire to abuse that power, then Krishna allows that to happen. So, for example, when Duryodhana tried to disrobe Draupadi, tried to dishonor and disrobe Draupadi, it was not that Krishna's desire that his devotee be dishonored. the duryodhana has an evil desire and because duryodhana by his past karma had royal authority for some time he within the area of his free will could do that grievous wrong of course if we do wrong sooner or later we will have to bear the consequences of our actions and duryodhana also bore those consequences when he was defeated and destroyed in the kurukshetra war so god is the supreme controller in the sense that nothing happens without his sanction and whoever can do anything the capacity to act in that area is given by him, by god to them for that person but god is not responsible for the misdeeds that people do because they have their free will and they act accordingly by that understanding that god is not the sole controller we can ensure that when bad things happen to us we don't blame god for it rather than and if we think that god is the sole controller then we will start thinking that god is the cause of our suffering and that may alienate us from god but god is never the cause of our suffering he is the cure for our suffering no matter how many problems come in our life because of whichever person if we take shelter of krishna He can deliver us from those problems. Manchitta sarvadurgani, matprasada darshini. We become conscious of him. He will enable us to cross over all obstacles. That's by understanding that God is the supreme controller, not the sole controller. We can find out how best we can act according to His will within the situation that we find ourselves in. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So we'll watch one more short video. Then one Ram bet Wali from back here. Yeah. After the Rama sent the arrow and it hit Wali in the chest. Wali extracted the arrow and he saw the name Rama. <clears throat> he was shocked. At that time, immediately Ram, Lakshman, Sukadeva, everybody came close to him. And then Wali said, "Oh Ram," he says, "I don't know what I'm saying. I'm saying, 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 I'm Why is the person who is who is the center of the arrow is right here? Who is the center of the arrow? Ram. So then he asked Ram, "My dear Ram, I have heard you uh, as a person of the noblest character possible on earth, and I have praised you, glorified you several times, and the whole world has been glorifying you. This is uh, something which I cannot even believe my eyes that you can act in such a mean-minded way by hiding behind a tree and sending the." 
So how did you dare to do that? Will it not mar your reputation? He asked that question to Ram. Ram said, See, Wali, I am uh, representative of the Raghukula dynasty. And uh, currently Bharat is ruling the uh, Ayodhya and all the world. So he is ruling the world and, and on his behalf he has told me to rule the forests. We are Kshatriyas. Wherever we go, we have to rule. So on his behalf, I am a ruler of the forest. So in, in, while I am in the forest here, uh, your place also comes in the custody of the forest. And then he said, uh, in case you say you have a higher intelligence like a human being or like demigods, then uh, such a... Uh, or if you say you are a monkey, I will give you an answer either way, the Lord said. If you say you are only ordinary monkey, if you say like that, then the monkey and other forest animals can be hit from behind. Uh, every Chatriya king has the right to kill the animals from, from a bush or something. Hitting a tiger, deer, they would hide like that. Hide and hit. And if you claim that you are an evolved person, you are intelligent, you know, you know, you are like a demigod or like a human or better than human. Uh, and you are also speaking now. What is right, what is wrong. That means you are coming in a human or beyond category. You are an evolved person. In that case, you should not have taken the wife of Sugriva, whose name is Ruma. So you took away the wife of another man. Anybody who takes away the wife of another man is no better than an animal. So he can be hit from behind. So when Wali heard this, immediately surrendered to Ram. Oh Ram, who can beat you in an argument? You are the Supreme God, you are all knowing. He said, I am a fool. He said, I misbehaved with my brother. Uh, actually, I, I misjudged my brother, Sugriva, and bet him very severely, uh, unnecessarily, and I stole his wife for the improper behavior on my part. Then he took off his necklace. Uh, and then, naturally, anybody will think that this, uh, this victory necklace which he had, he was supposed to give to whom? His son, Angada. But then he knew that Lord Ram wanted Sugriva to become the king. Then he took the necklace and without hesitation put it on Sugriva's neck. And he also caught hold of Sugriva's hands and said, Oh brother, please forgive me. Because I am going to die now. I don't want to maintain any ego. I admit that I did a wrong thing by killing your wife, please forgive me. And I strongly beg you, please forgive me for that. He sought forgiveness. He gave the all necklace and he called Angada. And told his son Angada, please follow Sugriva. As much as you followed me. So this is glory of Wali while leaving the body. Because actually, he did not protest against Ram, rather he surrendered to Ram. So he got the Sadhguti to speak the right thing at the time of living. Hare Krishna. So um, we can discuss any questions or uh, comments that you have on the class today. I think there was a question earlier about not being able to chant. I don't know if Mataji is still here. Uh, otherwise, we can take questions on the class first. Thank you very much for uh, joining us for today's session. I hope you are benefiting from these sessions. Pancha Kalpada Rupiascha.